Hello, everybody. We are now recording. This is episode two of Online Teaching Tuesdays. We are very lucky to be greeted here by Maha Bali and Sherry Spalik, who have come in to chat with us. And obviously, we're going to be led by our fearless leader, Bonnie Stewart. Just so that you, those of you know, we are being recorded. Uh, we will post that video at some point somewhere, probably on k12.olaya.ca. And uh, we're going to start out with a little bit of an introduction, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and then we're going to go ahead and do a question and answer after that. So if you wanna go ahead and drop your questions in the Q&A during this part of things, we can catch up with them later. And then of course, feel free to chat away inside the chat room, but do switch your toggle from all panelists to all panelists and attendees so we can all share your wisdom together. Bonnie, take it away. All right, welcome folks. Thanks for being here. Thanks for taking the time to hang out with us and drop in. Um, we are, just one second, sorry, that is not forwarding. This whole session is, as we move online, how do we do this together? What kind of questions do we want to bring? And these sessions are not about tools, but they are about pedagogy. We all work in, well, we work all over the world. We work, some of us may work in education, in formal spaces, some of us in informal spaces, some in higher ed, some in K-12, all over. So there may be specific institutional or board type policies around what platforms you can use those questions should really go to the people best suited in your environment to answer institutionally what's supported we want to talk about how do we make this meaningful right how do we create meaningful learning experiences in online spaces and one of the the key pieces for this is i i was on um i was on twitter over the weekend and I saw a couple of tweets pop up and go by. One was from an Ontario teacher, a high school teacher who was talking about going out for a walk with his three and a half year old who ended up seeing another little girl with a flower crown and exchanging flowers and talking about in the online spaces that we're in right now, um, in Canada, there's a move to actually move out of online and back to face-to-face, -face. and what kind of policing versus teaching boundaries does that set up for teachers, for educators, for kids, right? What kind of experience does that create? And, um, and then back in April, uh, Mahabali from Egypt, who's joining us today, had tweeted this around cheating because often in online spaces when we consider bringing any kind of content to um, the work that we do in an online space one of the first questions that gets asked is well what if the students are cheating and as was pointed out here um, it's not when we take our work online um, Sometimes if we're asking really simple kind of mastery questions, yes, people can go to Google or go to Wikipedia and get the answers to those questions. But um, being super concerned about that then leads us to a situation where we have proctors swooping in and going, oh my goodness, let's solve that problem for you by creating this online surveillance state around our online teaching. And so again, that's sort of a policing versus teaching um, tension. And that was sort of the, the focus that we wanted to bring to our discussion this week. All of the work that we're doing with these drop-ins is focused on keeping online teaching three things, simple, equitable, and engaging. And the reason for that is that even when some of us may be looking at moving our work online for fall, um, some of us may still be in the heat of the immediate transition, but no one has had time to take the, the long-term planning approach to pulling all of the course objectives, all of the things that we're trying to do, and, 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 and that online learning does know how to do um, into a digital space. And so this as a, as a mission statement for, for any educator, when you look at what you're planning, you can ask yourself, have I kept this simple? Is this equitable? Does this allow different students with different needs, different capacities, different digital systems to still engage? And is it remotely interesting because nobody wants to watch a three hour webinar? Um, great, that's where we kind of begin. Um, we have three recordings on k12olaya.ca from April 
uh, sessions specifically exploring this idea of simple, equitable, engaging in depth, an elementary focus and a K-12 focus. But here today, we're doing a much broader kind of audience and just sort of seeing what questions folks bring to that. We have two of my favorite um, online network colleagues who have agreed to join us today and they work in very different areas both geographically and in terms of sort of the students that they work with so I will let them introduce themselves and it's not spelled like David Spelitz. Uh, sure, go ahead. Everyone. Um, yeah this is this is actually what I do for a living so that's why I chose that wonderful uh, GIF. Um, Yes, so I teach physical education uh, at an international school in Vienna, Austria. And I've been there for a very long time. Uh, it's been over 25 years, I believe. And I've also coached track and field there, which is a great passion of mine. I think that's one of the things that I have probably done uh, consistently, maybe long, even longer than I've, than I've taught PE. Uh, yes, I have I recently published a book of essays uh, called Care at the Core, um, Essays on Identity, Education, and Power. Uh, I blog and tweet at Edified Listener. Um, and I have, I have two sons who are uh, old. One is old and the other one is still in school. So 25 and 12. And the sixth grader currently is uh, in his seventh week of, of online learning and we're still talking to each other. So uh, I think that's something to celebrate. And uh, at my school, we will be returning to campus on May 18th, elementary through middle school. And we just had a very long meeting today uh, about what that will require. So I think, imagine that will be part of our conversation this evening, because I probably have something to get off my chest. Okay, so on to you, Maha. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Maha Bailey. Hi everyone who I know and hi everyone that I don't know because I keep seeing names of people I know and it's distracting me. Um, so I work uh, here in Egypt at the American University in Cairo. I work at the Center for Learning and Teaching there. So my job is mainly as a faculty developer, so to help other people with their teaching. Um, but I also teach my own course on digital literacies and intercultural learning. Um, and of course, a lot of what I do to support other teachers is with this move online. Um, with the caveat that, as Bonnie was saying, like this quick, hurried move online is very different from what we've known about online teaching for a long time, and also because of the COVID-19 situation. It seems to require sort of different uh, sensibilities. Um, and I also do all kinds of other connect ways of connecting with people online in different ways, but I don't need to talk about all of that right now. Uh, and of course, the other really, really important role I'm, I'm going through these days as a mother of an eight-year-old who's learning online for the first time and being someone who's in the field of education it's, it's slightly more frustrating I think than, than it is for most people and this is where I blog I blogged at Mahabharita awesome um, thank you both and so Right now, what we're what we're going to do is just turn this over to Dave. I'll stop screen sharing. Um, the first question I actually wanted to throw out today, uh, before we go to what's in the Q and A, is just in terms of that tension. How, first of all, while we've been in this online space, what in your teaching, in your practice, in your parenting, where are you seeing that tension come out between what we do as educators and what we do as police of others, behaviors, bodies, learning, whatever. Um, Maha, why don't you go first and then, uh, and then I'll turn it to you, Sherry, sorry. Okay, um, so I, I, I wanna answer this on three levels. I'm gonna try to be quick. On the university level, uh, my institution was going through this process of should we get online proctoring or not? And I was talking to my students about this and that article that I tweeted out came out just as we were starting to have this conversation. Um, and so I had this conversation with my students and they were talking about how, you know, if they give us a proctoring tool, we'll find a way around it. But if they don't give us a proctoring tool, we might actually be honest and not cheat. So that was a very interesting conversation. Um, and, and my center was working about helping faculty imagine how they could do their assessments in ways that were authentic, that would actually let students learn something more useful. 
rather than think about how do I stop them from cheating, think about how do you design an assessment that's not easy to cheat and that's more useful. Because the fact of life is the internet exists outside of school, right? And so people should be able to use it. Um, the other dimension outside of uh, my institution, eventually a uh, very few people are using the proctoring uh, because a lot of faculty started to feel like they don't want to surveil students in their homes while they're doing exams. They don't want to add to the stress of the situation, which I think is also really important. Like everyone is super stressed and doing something like that is adding to that stress. And that's sometimes the reason people don't do it. Not because they think it's not, that there's a problem with it pedagogically, but because they don't want people, the students to feel more stressed than they are. But there's the other element is my kid being in school and, and the idea of, I never signed up to homeschool and I don't feel like it's, like I have to have the job of telling my kid to go online and do her homework and do the whatever. And I was realizing that her teacher was not, was assigning a lot of stuff, but only talking to them in, in short synchronous sessions about particular stuff. And so in the end, I'm like, you know what? If you're not gonna motivate her to do the other stuff, I'm not gonna do that. I don't wanna spend you know, this stressful time uh, bugging my child about, about doing stuff for you. So she has to know that it's from you, not from me, or from the teacher, not from the parent. Uh, and if it's important, you figure out how to get her to do it, not me. Uh, and then the third one related to physical uh, distancing is that I'm finding it really hard. Uh, I'm trying to get my kid to go out a little bit and see her friends from a distance, but of course it's really hard to tell them not to touch or stay away or don't. And, and, and I'm, I'm worried about these children growing up becoming, you know, having sort of phobias from, from physical uh, intimacy with people. And so I don't know what's gonna happen with that. My, my child is a big hugger, like everyone who's met her knows. She just wants to hug everyone all the time. And she says, as soon as this is over, I'm having a hugging party. <laughs> so <laughs> I know if she was in Vienna right now, you, she would not be allowed into that school. <laughs> so go ahead, Sherry. You know, I, I have so many thoughts about this. And um, I, I, I think my first issue of, of, this, of this teaching and policing thing actually comes from, from the parenting side. So, you know, the first weeks of, of me and uh, my son being at home together, and we, it's interesting because we really started out at the big table in the living room, and I had my corner, he had his corner, and, and it seemed like, hey, this might work. Well, that lasted for about a day. Um, and then we, and then of course there was this tension because I was, you know, after the second day, third day, I was asking, so uh, do you have your next class or do you need to do this? And he said, mom, don't be so toxic. Okay, so you get the picture. Uh, but really one of, the, one of the biggest lessons I think throughout this for me has been, I need to let go, the thing, all the things that I need to let go of. I need to let him do his thing and either he gets stuff done or he doesn't and of course it has happened that i got some messages from his teacher saying this is not done and i had to say hey i hear this isn't done um and then we have that conversation so letting go and letting him do that but also with my students i teach pe and online what that means is i send them a micro lesson. It's something like a, a two minute video, either for younger children, follow along, do what I do, and send me a short video of that or, or a picture, whatever. Or maybe for older kids, it's a, a list of do these things and tell me something about it afterwards. I have no idea how much or if the thing is actually being done. I mean, I, yes, I, I can see on a video, yes, that's lovely, and I love the videos, short videos, not two minutes and 30 seconds, now seems long to me. Um, but the key for me is, is I, I can't control. I can't control what they're doing, how much they're doing. So I have to look at it differently. I have to relate to say, hey, that's great. That's awesome. You did something. Thank you for contributing. Thank you for giving something back. And and that's it. So it's, it's a, a real challenge. And, and so this notion of letting go with, with the online thing is, has been a, a big one for me. I think that whole idea of control, Sherry, is, is really important for us to talk, to talk about in education and frankly has always been really important for us to talk about in education, but we haven't always done it. Um, I came out of a faculty of ed type of 
education where we were, you know, specifically taught classroom management as if that sort of command and control version of what it means to educate was still implicitly very, very important to our success as teachers, right? If, if your classroom is too exciting, then there is probably the judgment, particularly if you're working with younger students, that they're not somehow learning. And so we need to unpack that idea in our minds between um, what is control and what is learning and perhaps begin to p pull apart where those pieces live. It's not the only fault line that this shift makes visible, but it definitely is one of one of the key ones there, I think. Um, Dave, do you wanna maybe throw some of the questions that are in the, the chat room at us? I, so am, that I am happy to. I think we'll have to keep coming back to the lunchbox question. I'm leaving that there because I love that question. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> this is a, the first question I wanna address is one that I keep getting every week over and over again. Uh, Bonnie and I, you and I got it this morning. So people talk about meaningful assessment and we all have ideas in our heads about what that is. And I just wonder if everybody could go around the table and everybody could give one example of what they mean by a meaningful assessment and what that looks like. So just like a practical, here's something that I do or something I've seen someone else do and what does that look like all the way through. So uh, whoever gets to go first gets to steal the easiest example. So who wants to, uh, uh, Bonnie's got the big smile on her face. Okay, Bonnie, why don't you go first? And then, uh, and then we'll go uh, from the way I see you, from my left to my right. So we'll go Bonnie, Sherry, Maha, and then... And the person who, who actually wasn't uh, unmuted at that point. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no problem. Uh, so for me, in a sense, I think it, it may be easy because a lot of, I teach at a higher ed level. I used to teach high school English social studies, actually phys ed. Um, that was not where I was called by the universe to be, assure you. Um, it was just the contract that I happened to have at the start of my career. And um, <clears throat> there we are. I wish I'd known you better then, Sherry. Um, but I teach a lot of digital technologies, adult learning um, in that kind of area of education. And so I've got a fair amount of freedom to make courses participatory and to encourage students not to deal so much with in education, we talk about Bloom's taxonomy, the triangle of kind of mastery learning skills up to higher order thinking skills. And the type of content that I'm working with in lends itself to higher order thinking type skills like, hey, rather than read about digital literacy and write an essay on it, why don't you create perhaps even a public or at least digital artifact um, that shows some of the aspects of, of digital literacy by um, integrating visuals and into thinking about symbolic language and color schemes and audience and put that out there, whether for classmates for peer review or for the whole internet for peer review. That's the type of thing that I'm able to do in my class, but everyone teaches different things, of course. Okay. Uh, hmm. In my case, physical education, right? If I ask you to, uh, today, kicking at a target. If I set the target and tell you where to kick from, then I can determine if you can get the ball from here into the target from this distance, that's satisfactory. Now, what's interesting is that I found it is much more interesting for me as a teacher, for my students as learners, if they set the target and they decide what they're going to kick and from where. Now, that sounds a little strange, like, well, how will you know if it's a good kick? Oh, I, can, I, can, I can look at a kick and I can say, oh, this is good technique. But what I'm really interested in is for that learner, what is it, what choices are they making about how they want to accomplish the task? How interested are they in the challenge? And what might the reasons for those choices be? So I, it's easy for me to find out or to figure out or to determine, yes, you can kick well under these circumstances, but it's a much more interesting conversation that we can have about the learner, the, the topic, in this case, kicking at a target, and about each other, like 
so I, I can have a conversation with that student about, well, tell me about why you chose this tiny target for kicking. What, could, might there have been, a, could you have made a different choice or what other kinds of uh, target might be a good one for kicking at? So um, I'm interested in the kinds of assessment that allow me to engage in a dialogue with the learner and then we can expand on that. I love that, Sherry. Um, I was writing in the chat that I'm, I do agree with the Maslow before Bloom thing, uh, but I also don't like either of them because they have universalized taxonomies and they assume a lot of different things. But one of them is, is the universalizing thing, which again, I think is kind of what you're alluding to. And what I'm thinking about is that education is about much more than learning outcomes. And the problem is that a lot of online education, especially tends to focus on the learning outcomes rather than focusing on the connections or the values. I mean, there are other theories of education that do that, but a lot of the traditional online learning that gets done for schools and universities doesn't follow that kind of thing. And in these particular circumstances, the socio-emotional development of young children and even youth and us, like that's the most important part. And I feel like schools need to focus on how we're trying to find assessments that will help students be in the world right now. So for example, I'll give you an example. I, I teach digital literacies and intercultural learning and it's, I don't do exams. It was never a thing that I did. I haven't done an exam in a really long time in my life as a teacher. Um, so for example, one of the things that my students were supposed to do for the class was they were supposed to design a choose your own pathway digital game. And as soon as we locked down, they were about to get started on theirs. And I said, okay, let's stop here for a second. If you want to create your choose your own pathway game about a COVID-19 topic, about the experience of COVID-19 to build awareness or to raise empathy about what you're going through, you can do that. Or if you really don't want to talk about COVID-19 because you're so sick of listening to it all the time, you can do something completely different. And I also thought of something else, another adjustment that I made. I was like, you know what? Maybe right now that's not how people want to express themselves. So even though normally it would be important for me that they learn the digital skill of creating a game online, I said, you know, if you want to do it as a video digital story, that's fine. You want to write it as a multi-perspective poem or uh, or just autobiographical type of thing you can do that too as long as you do the research and so they're still meeting most of the learning outcomes that whatever that's not the most important thing for me the most important thing for me was that this assignment actually helps them get through this what we're going it's not about meeting my learning outcomes but being a useful thing for them to do right now and so for example when 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 in my kids school they they do things like they're going to learn about representation of data. And I'm thinking, you know, they could so use data related to like COVID-19 so that the kids, when they watch the news, they can start to understand these charts that they're seeing. And they're not doing that. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like there are ways to make these connections. I'm sure every professional is making connections to like those who teach economics, they're making connections. You know, 90% of disciplines will have some kind of connection to this. Maybe the ones that will really suffer are the ones who are like very engineering focused on a very particular area of engineering. But that's an applied discipline. The thing about what drives me crazy is that applied disciplines should be able to do authentic assessments that are like what someone would do in real life when they go and work. Why, they, why this is a big paradigm shift for them, but I understand that it is, but why it is in the first place is strange to me. Like there should be a step back in education. I think every, everyone in education needs to rethink all of this. We've always wanted them to rethink it. Now they're having to sort of rethink it. Um, but it's also honestly not fair because it's a very stressful time to have to rethink it. So it's, it's kind of, what we've done in my, um, my center is that we've offered them lots of resources on this. We've done several webinars and we'll think through it. And then if a department as a whole, like the economics department comes to us and says, we're having problems with this, we'll do some extra research. We'll get the ones who are there who are already done the paradigm shift to help the ones who haven't because there's no way that any like we were just talking about this before none of us teaches everything none of us understands every discipline we're just imagining what we know from the basics we know but of course someone in the field will be able to help someone else in the field maybe if they speak to someone who's in the work environment who's not in academia they'd be able to help them even more so yeah i, I would also just throw in on the end of that um amanda had mentioned in as you were speaking Maha, uh, um, she had put out options for students to do 
things related to the current situation, sometimes they'll choose not to. Same as sometimes my students will ask for much more kind of traditional formal, I signed up for this class expecting A and I would like A because <laughs> then I will know when it's done. And not everybody is always in your learning environment to have a deep personal experience with themselves, even if I believe as an educator that I'm there to offer that kind of deep personal reflexive experience where you're making connections. Um, when I have a year with students, I have time to build buy-in to that kind of social contract. When I have a short-term moment, um, I may or may not, and people may end up disappointed because they didn't kind of get the experience that they were anticipating. And, and Rissa's making some points here around sometimes in some fields, there, there is a real divide because the folks who go into the academic stream and the folks who go into the industry stream um, tend not to ever be the same people, right? People diverge right after the point at which formal education ends. Um, so this is always going to be a your mileage may vary. Any teaching situation anyway, your mileage may vary. Any online teaching situation, I would amplify that up on every axis of it. Do we have a couple more questions? So I'm going to bridge into the next question and it's almost, it grows out of this one. And that's the, it sort of turns the question on its head and it says, well, those are examples of what you might do and how that impacts your own teaching. But for a lot of people in this chat room, and I see Vicki Allen Cook there, who I worked with for, I was fortunate enough to work with for a couple of years in, in PEI. Uh, and I think about the questions that she's getting as somebody who helps coach um, people in her K-12 school district. But certainly I know I spend a lot of time talking to university uh, professors in my own work. And that's, what do we tell the people when they ask us the question? Because it's one thing to say, here's what I do. It's something else to sort of give that advice to people. And sort of one of the things that I always try to think about is if your assessment is, tr is helping someone get better, then you're probably on the authentic assessment track. If your assessment is judging somebody at what they're doing, you may be going down the wrong road. And not always, not all the time, but when you move that to the internet, particularly, the internet responds to copy and paste answers, right? If you're judging whether or not somebody got the right answer and everybody's answer should be the same, you're probably gonna run yourself into trouble, right? And those are the kinds of things that I try to say to people whenever they're, they're taking that first step. I'm also gonna drop a, uh, a really simple website because somebody's asking for resources too. So the question was, what advice do you have and what resources would you send? This is from TRU. Uh, Thompson Rivers University here in Canada is a really simple website that has some really nice practical advice on how to do good assessment, good discussion, open book assessment, student reflections, just really, really simple stuff. So it's a double question and you're happy, to, I'm happy for you to take one or both of, of the questions. The first of it is, how, what should someone, what is the advice you can give to someone to give to someone else whenever they come to them and say, how do I make this happen? Like, what do I do to make authentic assessment? How do I make meaningful experiences? What's that first piece of advice that you would give to somebody that they can hand to somebody else? We're gonna start with Maha this time. So there was, um, there was this website, it's called Cutting Edge Course Design Tutorial. I'll try to find the link. And one of the, the things they said about authentic assessment is that you don't ask yourself, what do I want the student to do in this course? You ask the students, what do, you ask yourself, what do the students need to do in the world with this course eventually? Um, and, and incrementally work towards that. And so even so that students can see the big picture, because this is actually what we hear all the time from students, like, why am I studying this? Why do I need to know this? And if your assessments are working towards helping them do something that they understand the value of in the world outside, um, they, can, they can see that. But the thing is, I think, I think it's also helpful to see what other people do. And there's a lot of websites um, that do that, you know? So they, yes, that's the one, thank you. That's the right one, thank you. Um, is things like, I'm trying to think if there's something, I mean, things like case study types of things are pretty common, right, across disciplines. And so they can see things like that and take ideas from there. Okay, the problem, I think, with, with asking people to, some people might imagine how to create an assessment like that, but they don't know how to scaffold it, or they don't know how to assess it, like, and create rubrics for it and things like that. And 
some and that's one of the things that I think someone they might need to work with someone to help them do it but not everyone wants to do that or has the time to do that right so I think I need I think we need to recognize that it's not easy uh, it's not an easy thing to throw out there and say oh yeah try try doing this new thing that you've never done before with students who never done it before. Um, I mean, this is actually one of the problems that happened in Egypt. They, for K to 12, they assign them projects instead of exams, but all their lives they've been memorizing. The teachers have been teaching them to memorize, and all of a sudden they have to do a project. Nobody knows how to how to go about that unless their parents can help them. So everyone's frozen for me, so I'm not sure if I'm getting heard well. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. But I'm going to stop here and hand it over. Sherry? Um. This I feel like this is maybe the worst question to ask me, um, because, uh, and and but but I realized well while Maha was talking I I thought actually what you really should do is picture for yourself what is the the very antithesis of what you would consider an authentic assessment. So what's the worst assessment that you could possibly imagine for your students, and work from there. And think about all the things that it's not going to be. And I, I this, this is not come. This did not just evolve out of the ether. Actually, once upon a time, uh, Maha asked me to to uh, respond to a provocation for a workshop. And the provocation was, uh, what would you do to design a learning experience that is uh, that marginalizes uh, participants, or or that that uh, yeah, that was right. Something like that. But anyway, the point was this, and, and, and I took it from my perspective as a PE teacher, and I kind of listed all the things that I would do to make it a really difficult and uh, nearly impossible to navigate kind of situation for a learner. And that, listening to, actually, when I listened to it a couple of times, I thought, man, this is really, this tells me a lot about what assessment often looks like in a lot of situations. And these are the things that uh, I maybe I didn't realize that I have a tendency to do, but actually maybe I do do, and I shouldn't. Like I don't really want to be doing those things. So, but I do think there's there's a real advantage in asking ourselves, what is the opposite? What's the what's the worst that it could be, and then make sure that you don't do those things. Work the other way. That's fun, Bonnie. I, I would just throw in one of the things that that. Rethinking assessment for authentic assessment online or off forces us to consider is what are our real goals? What are we really teaching, right? How do we pare this down to what we want the students to take away? And Maha mentioned rubrics. Um, one of the things that I've had to do in opening up some of my assessments is try to create an open rubric that lets students know broadly what targets or success criteria I'm looking for and what matters. And then realizing as the assess as the assignments come in, right, and I get infographics and videos and all different things that maybe I've actually got to reconsider that. And maybe I've actually got to tell the students, hey, I've got to reconsider that. Now I teach pre service teachers, I teach teacher candidates who will be teachers. So I think there's real value in me opening up about that power position and going, you know what, I messed this up but I'm not gonna take it out on you. It's super important that I communicate that so that they get that message um, and hopefully pass that on to their eventual students. It may be more difficult if you have a bunch of grade three students or folks, if you're not in the same situation where you're modeling teaching for people. Um, but this does take a lot of time, it takes a lot of work. And that success criteria thing, Karen, who's here today, had asked me uh, in a private chat uh, after last week's session um, about success criteria. And I think success criteria are important to give students signals of what they need to be doing. And at the same time, I'm watching one of my kids teachers who's putting a lot of success criteria on assignments that maybe the real gist is, you know, to, to do X and maybe the kid missed a tiny thing on the way. And sometimes the teacher is getting a little over focused on that tiny thing that got missed along the way because as teachers, it can be, it can feel like, well, I can't give just positive feedback. I need to be able to say, hey, excuse me, there's a little scratch there on your face or, or whatever. Um, but 
we got to be careful that our feedback and our our relationship to the student gets communicated in the way we respond to these assignments. Um, and so, yes, give clear success criteria, but try not to hang on to them as the be all and the end all. Um, and particularly in online spaces, that's important because some of the kindness by which, by which you might express that in um, a face-to-face -face or even video setting doesn't always come across when it's a comment or as is the case in our school setting, uh, the grading feedback comes to the parents, but um, not to the students. I don't actually see the assignment. I don't actually see the success criteria. I just see, oh, they didn't do X, and then it's left on me to police, oh, excuse me, child, you didn't do X. Right. So there are complications in, in this environment. So I just want to highlight something Matt Crossland said uh, about 75 chats ago in the chat room because the chat room has been really active and that's I recommend taking courses on Aboriginal and Indigenous education to get away from our typical education theory cliches. Um, I think that's a solid recommendation in and of itself, but I also like to highlight what it represents and that's that experiencing your actual um, Experiencing the learning process is something that's really really helpful for people who maybe have been teaching for a super long time and haven't necessarily had to learn in a long time inside of a formalized environment. Like I highly recommend people who are doing their two hour PowerPoint lectures to watch that. Watch the whole thing. And when you're done watching that whole thing, go look in the mirror and ask yourself how you're feeling. Like seriously, like some of these things, it's easy, we get accustomed to sending them to people and doing it and feeling that that's okay. But having an experience of learning, and certainly Matt's example is a great one, something that we can all learn more about anyway, but any experience of learning, take your assignments and to Sherry's point, experience it. Go in and think about the worst thing, the worst feeling you can have and the worst situation you might be in in your house for that assignment. So if you're asking students to share their own feelings, are they protected inside their house? Are those feelings about other people inside their house? Is that a safe space for them to be in? Like trying to imagine your way through those assignments and think of yourself from the student perspective both through that experience, but also in the way that you assign them, I think is a really critical piece um, that we need to be able to do in terms of this. So what other things would you guys recommend that people do to get themselves in the right mindset? Bonnie, you have your hand up. Would you like to speak? Teacher me, I have one quick thing that just what you were saying reminded me of a few years back when I uh, was working with folks at Holland College in PEI, I was working with folks in um, different disciplinary areas to try to bring more digital and online literacies into their classrooms. And one of the things that they were finding, even then before we all had to go online, they were like, my students don't read. And we went, hmm, I wonder what we can do, right, to try to change the responsibility cycle in learning. Because so much of education, as I just threw in the chat room, gets treated as kind of a series of downloaders of responsibility. Oh, well, you were supposed to read that. Oh, well, you were supposed to watch that. I don't care how deadly boring I am after three hours. Um, I'm sure, you, I'm sure none of you are deadly boring after three hours, but some people are. Um, and instead, use the fact that you can do different things in digital spaces and switch it up. So one of my um, folks in that class, they were teaching a, learning, a, a nurse practitioner program. And they did case studies, but they found that the students weren't really responding to the case studies with deep engagement. And we said, you know, what would happen? And she really came up with this idea herself after we talked about what online would allow her to do. She assigned groups and she said, okay, instead, Sherry, you, you and your partner are going to build a case study for Maha and Dave as partners. You need to read up on diabetes and make a short three minute video where you doesn't have to have great production quality at all. It just needs to be literally audible, but include all of the symptoms of diabetes and then you post that and Maha and Dave have to solve it. Her engagement changed drastically because the students were then forced to take responsibility for creating something. I think many of us who teach realize that the best way to learn something is to have to teach it. Um, you can actually, in some settings, do some of that with students in an online space and make it very much authentic. But as I'm seeing the conversation around jobs and stress and all the things, we can't 
expect people to do the world and all. People can make a couple of short videos potentially, um, but you got to look at the situation that you're teaching in. Uh, we've got about four minutes left. I'm going to flip this over to our guests for some final commentary. Uh, given the conversation you're seeing in the chat room, giving your thoughts about the topic today, Sherry, what have you got to leave us with for today? I, I want to say a few words about teaching young kids um, online, because I think when, when you remember that the person on the other side of the screen, the person who's going to be on the receiving end of your feedback, of your lesson, is perhaps pre-literate, is, um, is, is, is simply a, a, young, a very young person and who, who is missing a lot of the routines of being in school and being with friends, then you have to really picture yourself, who am I to this person? Who am I to this child and to this child and to this child? And to really think about what's needed is, it's really not about, I, every time I have to remind myself, it's not about the kicking, the catching, the whatever. That's the vehicle. That's the reason that I appear to them because they know, ah, that's Mrs. Spielitz. She does this. But really, the best that I can do for my students right now is to continue to show up and to show up in a form that's familiar, that's reassuring, that is comforting, and is also the cheerleader, and, and to show them, hey, I'm, we're still here. I am still with you. I am thinking about you. And that means also that my feedback, be, it can't be, we don't get to have a dialogue. We just don't get it. So I really need to be encouraging regardless of what they do. I need to say, hey, thank you for that. Okay, so I, I really, I encourage you if you're working with young children, also with your children at home, Practice letting go, breathing a lot. Okay, so thanks. Uh-huh, last thoughts? I'm actually thinking uh, mostly along those same lines. I think, I think regardless of what we get done in terms of outcomes, I think what we need to model for, for young people, whether they're university students or very young children, is where priorities are in this time and what it means to be you know, just a, a good person and a good citizen in this time and to how, how to show care to others. And, and the tricky thing is not everyone knows how to share, show care online. It's not a very easy thing to do. And what I've been sort of advising people to do is try to meet people in smaller groups. It really makes a huge difference. It feels a little bit more like eye contact and intimacy when you're meeting six or seven people than if you're meeting a hundred. If you're meeting 100, break them up into small groups so that they can talk to each other. And when I did that with my students a couple of times, they were so grateful for this opportunity to connect with each other and feel like they're sitting in small groups in the classroom um, rather than always just being all like a lump of people. Uh, we've, we've had the, the, the privilege of having met them face to face before we moved online. But as we move into the summer uh, and people having to teach online in the summer, and I do not want to even imagine school kids at my child's age starting a new school year like this and how traumatic that'll probably be for them. But it's, it's just, again, focusing on their well-being and their socio-emotional uh, situation. It, remembering what people were saying in the chat, there is a pandemic happening, there are, there are health crises, there are economic uh, problems. It's not all about the teaching, like we're keeping going with the teaching. I don't know if it's for financial reasons or just to kid ourselves that everything's okay. But there, there's more happening and honestly, some days I'm not okay. And just the other day I asked my students for forgiveness that I, I really was not mentally able to put up grades and they were so sweet about it. And so being vulnerable as well is really important. Like just being ourselves, being human. It is. And I think some of us, like I'm not teaching any longer, right? I'm done for the term. I'm thinking about September already at this point or, or I start again in August. Um, but everyone's at different spaces in where we are with this piece. But that again is part of the equity piece, right? Recognizing that we, we do have to meet people where they are. And um, I just wanna thank everybody for taking the time from where they are to join us today for a really great conversation. Uh, Maha, Sherry, thank you so much for sharing your ideas um, and for those really important 
it's kind of just things to chew on as we all go forward. Um, one of the last things I want to say is uh, something that gets thrown around a lot in our culture is that, well, online isn't the same as face-to-face -face because people don't connect. And the truth is there are many different ways to connect online, particularly if you are kind of planning for the long-term building connection between students isn't something that the digital totally um, erases. But if you are interested in taking some time to learn about that, it can be a really important part of meaning that your online spaces do have connection possible in them. I know time is up, but can I share a very quick story about you and me, Bonnie? Sure, I'd love so that. Before Bonnie and I ever met on a synchronous call like this one, we were friends in text on Facebook and Twitter for a long time. A lot of it was public as part of a Facebook group, but a lot of it was also private. And I remember, I remember this day so well. There was one day I, I had a very bad dream and I woke up and for some reason in my dream, Bonnie was the person who gave me solace in my dream. And I connected with her that day and she'd been having a bad, a really difficult day as well. And it was just one of those things like when, it, when it's with someone you know face to face, you can imagine why there might be telepathy or some kind of connection there. But it can happen with your online friends too if, you're really, if they're really on your mind and in your heart. And, and all the three people here, Dave, Sherry, Vaughn, and a lot of you guys online, and you know that, we have those connections. It's much harder to build them with your face-to-face -face folks because you're not used to having to connect with them online. <laughs> so it's another layer of complexity, but the fact that it's possible. Yeah, it is possible. And I just, I want to thank you so much. Um, yeah, for, for, your, uh, for your thoughts, for your friendship, and, and for sharing here. And I encourage all of you who are here um, to, to just consider kind of becoming part of our larger communities and continuing to be part of these discussions in a variety of ways and on any platforms that work for you um, within the time that you have because these connections are real and, and important for students to, to see as possible as well. I'm gonna close it because I'm mindful that we're over time, but thanks so much. We're on again next week. We have uh, John Schinker and Helen DeWard joining us as our guests next week um, and 3.15 uh, in Ontario time, EDT, talk soon.